record this. Hopefully that doesn't add any pressure, but I thought I should tell you so you knew. Um, so welcome everyone to PoFest. This is our first virtual PoFest. And first of all, I wanna thank Ed Sams. He is the originator of the PoFest and he bequeathed it to me. And I am very honored to take up the mantle, the raven, if you will, of PoFest. So the way this is going to work is the presenters, I'll, I'll read their name, introduce them, and then they will unmute themselves. And then the screen will go to them, hopefully. I hear a cat coming. But if you want to have your screen focused on the reader, which would probably be nice, you can just hit speaker view at the top, as opposed to gallery view, if you want it to switch to the person that is, is reading. All right, so our first reader is Brandon Liu. I'm gonna ask, e I'm going to introduce each reader and then they will tell you what they're reading. So Brandon, he is a veteran of PoFest. He is baleful Brandon, that's how he's known at the PoFest. So he will be our first reader. Am I up then? All right then, hello old friend. Normally, I'd be performing this in some capacity, but uh, since we're in the virtual spaces here, I'll just give you a nice little reading, like a little cozy chat. So I'll be reading a good old cask of Amontillado, the abridged version. Here we go. <clears throat> the thousand injuries of Fortunato I had borne as best I could but when he ventured upon insult, I vowed revenge. I must not only punish, but punish with impunity. A wrong is unredressed when retribution overtakes its redresser. It is equally unredressed when the avenger fails to make himself felt as such to him who has done the wrong. It must be understood that neither by word nor deed had I given Fortunato cause to doubt my goodwill. I continued, as was my inn, to smile in his face, and he did not perceive that my to smile now was at the thought of his immolation. He had a weak point, this Fortunato, although in other regards, he was a man to be respected and even feared. He prided himself on his connoisseurship in wine. Few Italians have the true virtuoso spirit, but in the matter of old wines, Fortunato was sincere. It was about dusk one evening during the supreme madness of the carnival season that I encountered my friend. He accosted me with excessive warmth for he had been drinking much. The man wore motley. He had on a tight fitting party striped dress and his head was surmounted by the conical cap and bells. I was so pleased to see him that I thought I never should have done wringing his hand. I said to him, my dear Fortunato, you are luckily met. How remarkably well you're looking today. But I have received a pipe of what passes for a Montelado, and I have my doubts. How, said he, a Montelado, a pipe? Impossible, and in the middle of the carnival. I have my doubts, I replied, and I was silly enough to pay the full Amontillado price without consulting you in the matter. You were not to be found, and I was fearful of losing a bargain. Amontillado. I have my doubts. Amontillado. And I must satisfy them. Oh, Amontillado. As you are engaged, I am on my way to Lucrezzi. If anyone has a critical turn, it is he. He will tell me, Lucrezzi cannot tell Amontillado from Sherry. And yet some fools will have it that his taste is a match for your own. Come, let us go. Whither? To your vaults. Oh, my friend, no, I will not impose upon your good nature. I perceive you have an engagement. Uh, Lucrezzi, I have no engagement. 
Come. Oh, my friend, no. It is not the engagement, but the severe cold with which I perceive you are afflicted. The faults are insufferably damp. They are encrusted with nitre. Let us go, nevertheless. The cold is merely nothing. Amontillado. You have been imposed upon. As, as for Lucrezia, he cannot distinguish Sherry from Amontillado. Thus speaking, Fortunato possessed himself of my arm, and putting on a mask of black silk and drawing a roquelaire closely about my person, I suffered him to hurry me to my palazzo. There were no attendants at home. They had absconded to make merry in honor of the time. I told them that I should not return until the morning and had given them explicit orders not to stir from the house. These orders were sufficient, I well knew, to ensure their immediate disappearance, one and all, as soon as my back was turned. I took from the sconces two flambeaux and giving one to Fortunato, bowed him through several suites of rooms to the archway that led into the vaults. I passed down a long and winding staircase, requesting him to be cautious as he followed. We came at length to the foot of the descent and stood together upon the damp ground of the catacombs of the Montresors. The gait of my friend was unsteady and the bells upon his cap jingled as he strode. <clears throat> the pipe, he said. It is farther on, said I, but observe the white web work which gleams from these cavern walls. He turned towards me and looked into my eyes with two filmy orbs that distilled the room of intoxication. Niter, he asked at length. Niter, I replied. How long have you had that cough? <coughs> <laughs> My poor friend found it impossible to reply for many minutes. Oh, it is nothing, he said at last. Come, I said with decision. We will go back. Your health is precious. You are rich, respected, admired, beloved. You are happy, as I once was. You are a man to be missed. For me, it is no matter. We will go back. You will be ill, and I cannot be responsible. Besides, there is Lucrezia. Enough, he said. The cough is a mere nothing. It will not kill me. I shall not die of a cough. True. True, I replied. And indeed, I had no intention of alarming you unnecessarily. But you should use all proper caution. A draft of this medoc will defend us from the damps. Here, I knocked off the neck of a bottle which I drew from a long row of its fellows that lay upon the mold. Drink, I said, presenting him the wine. He raised it to his lips with a leer. He paused and nodded to me familiarly while his bells jingled. I drink, he said, to the buried that repose around us. And I to your long life. He again took my arm and we proceeded. These vaults, he said, are extensive. The Montresors, I replied, were a great and numerous family. I forget your arms. A huge human foot, door in a field azure. The foot crushes a serpent rampant whose fangs are embedded in the heel. And the motto? Nemo me impion la cecit. Good, he said. The wine sparkled in his eyes and the bells jingled. My own fancy grew warm with the medoc. We had passed through long walls of piled skeletons into the inmost recesses of the catacombs. I paused again, and this time I made bold to seize Fortunato by an arm above the elbow. The niter, I said, see, it increases. It hangs like moss upon the vaults. We are below the river's bed. The drops of moisture trickle among the bones. Come, we will go back ere it is too late. Your cough. It is nothing, he said. Let us go on. The first, another draft of the Medoc. I broke and reached him a flagon of the Grave. He emptied it at a breath. His eyes flashed with a fierce light. 
He laughed and threw the bottle upwards with a gesticulation I did not understand. I looked at him in surprise. He repeated the movement, a grotesque one. You do not comprehend, he said. Not I, I replied. Then you are not of the Brotherhood. How? You are not of the Masons. Yes, uh, yes, I said. Yes, yes. You? Impossible. A Mason? A Mason, I replied. A sign, he said. A sign. It is this, I answered, producing from beneath the folds of my roclair a trowel. You jest, he exclaimed, recoiling a few paces. But let us proceed to the amontillado. Be it so, I said, replacing the tool beneath the cloak and again offering him my arm. He leaned upon it heavily. We continued our route in search of the amontillado. We passed through a range of low arches, descended, passed on, and descending again, arrived at a deep crypt in which the foulness of the air caused our flambeau rather to glow than flame. It was in vain that Fortunato, uplifting his dull torch, endeavored to pry into the depth of the recess. Its termination, the feeble light, did not enable us to see. Proceed, I said, herein is the amontillado. As for Lucreci, he is an ignoramus, interrupted my friend as he stepped unsteadily forward, while I followed immediately at his heels. He had reached the extremity of the niche, and finding his progress arrested by the rock, stood stupidly bewildered. A moment more, and I had fettered him to the granite. He was much too astonished, he was much too astounded to resist. Withdrawing the key, I stepped back from the recess. Pass your hand over the wall. You cannot help feeling the nitre. Indeed, it is very damp. Once more, let me implore you to return. No, then I must positively leave you. But I must first render you all the little attentions in my power. The Amontillado, ejaculated my friend, not yet recovered from his astonishment. True, I replied, the Amontillado. As I said these words, I busied myself among a pile of bones, throwing them aside, I soon uncover a quantity of building stone and mortar. With these materials and with the aid of my trowel, I began vigorously to wall up the entrance of the niche. I had scarcely laid the first tier of the masonry when I discovered that the intoxication of Fortunato had in a great measure worn off. The earliest indication I had of this was a low moaning cry from the depth of the recess. It was not the cry of a drunken man. Then there was a long and obstinate silence. I laid the second tier and the third and the fourth. And then I heard the furious vibrations of the chain. The noise lasted for several minutes during which that I might hearken to it with the more satisfaction. I ceased my labors and sat down upon the bones. When at last the clanking subsided, I resumed the trowel and finished without interruption the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh tier. The wall was now nearly upon a level with my breast. I again paused and holding the flambeau over the mason work threw a few feeble rays upon the figure within. A succession of loud and shrill screams bursting suddenly forth from the throat of the chained form seemed to thrust me violently back. For a brief moment, I hesitated. I trembled, but the thought of an instant reassured me. I reapproached the wall. I replied to the yells of him who clamored. I re-echoed. I aided them. Ah. Oh. I surpassed them in volume and in strength. I did this and the clamorer grew still. It was now midnight 
and my task was drawing to a close. There remained but a single stone to be fitted and plastered in. I struggled with its weight. I had placed it partially in its destined position. But now there came, from out the niche, a low laugh that erected the hairs upon my head. It was succeeded by a sad voice, which I had difficulty in recognizing as that of the noble Fortunato. The voice said, <laughs> A very good joke indeed, an excellent jest. We will have many a rich laugh about it at the Palazzo. <laughs> over our wine. <laughs> the Amontillado, I said. <laughs> ah, yes, the Amontillado. But is it not getting late? Will they not be awaiting us at the Palazzo? The Lady Fortunato and the rest? Let us be gone. Yes, I said. Let us be gone. For the love of God, Montresor. Yes, I said, for the love of God. But to these words, I hearkened in vain for a reply. I grew impatient. I called aloud, Fortunato? No answer. I called again, Fortunato? No answer still. I thrust a torch through the remaining aperture and let it fall within. There came forth in return only a jingling of the bells. My heart grew sick. It was the dampness of the catacombs that made it so. I hastened to make an end of my labor. I forced the last stone into its position. I plastered it up. Against the new masonry, I re-erected the old rampart of bones. For the half of a century, no mortal has disturbed them. In pass, requisite. Thank you. Yay, Brandon. Oh. Thank you. Very yeah, nice. If you eat them. It's a nice story about two friends having a happy hour. It's very, very friendly. When Brandon was in my class, I, I realized he had a future career in radio DJing, I think, if, if you wanted one. So thank you very much, Brandon. Uh, I'm going to share a link to the story in case anyone is interested, if you want to read the full version. Our next presenter is Dahlia Strada. Hello. I will be reading the poem called Alone. From childhood's hour, I have not been as others were. I have not seen as others saw. I could not bring my passions from a common spring. From the same source, I could not take in my sorrow. I could not awaken my heart of joy at the same tone. And all I loved, I loved alone. Then in my childhood, in the dawn of the most stormy life was drawn from every depth of good and ill. The mystery which binds me still from the torrent or the fountain, from the red cliff of the mountain, from the sun that round me rolled in its autumn tint of gold, from the lightning in the sky as it passed me flying by, from the thunder and the storm and the cloud that took the form when the rest of heaven was blue of a demon in my view. The end. Yay. All red. Very nice. Thank you. And good mask, good mask work. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, our next presenter is Erica Oi. Hello. I'm going to be reading an, ex an excerpt from The Pit and the Pendulum. Okay. Looking upward, I surveyed the ceiling of my prison. It was some 30 or 40 feet overhead and constructed much as a sidewalk. In one of its panels, a very singular figure riveted my whole attention. It was the painted figure of time as he is commonly represented, save that 
in lieu of a scythe, he held what, at a casual glance, I supposed to be the picture image of a huge pendulum, such as we see on antiques. There was something, however, in the appearance of this machine which caused me to regard it more attentively. While I gazed directly upward at it, for its position was immediately over my own, I fancied that I saw it in motion. In an instant afterward, the fancy was confirmed. Its sweep was brief and of course slow. I watched it for some minutes, somewhat in fear, but more in wonder. Wearied at the length with observing its dull movement, I turned my eyes upon the other objects in the cell. A slight noise attracted my notice and, looking to the floor, I saw several enormous rats traversing it. They had issued from the well, which lay just within view to my right. Even then, while I gazed, they came up in troops, hurriedly, oh, I lost my place, sorry, with ravenous eyes, allured by the scent of the meat. From this, it required much effort and attention to scare them away. It might've been half an hour, perhaps even an hour, for I could but take imperfect note of time before I again cast my eyes upward. What I then saw confounded and amazed me. The sweep of the pendulum had increased in extent by nearly a yard. As a natural consequence, its velocity was also much greater. But what mainly disturbed me was the idea that had perceptibly descended. I now observed, with what horror it is needless to say, that its nether extremity was formed of a crescent of glittering steel about a foot in length from horn to horn, the horns upward and the under edge evidently as keen as that of a razor. Like a razor also, it seemed massy and heavy, tapering from the edge into a solid and broad structure above. It was appended to a weighty rod of brass and the hole hissed as it swung through the air. I could no longer doubt the doom prepared for me by monkish ingenuity of torture. My cognizance of the pit had become known to inquisitorial agents, the pit whose horror had been destined for so bold a recusance as myself, the pit typical of hell and regarded by rumor as the ultima thule of all their punishments. The plunge into this pit I had avoided by the merest of accidents. I knew that surprise or entrapment into torment formed an important portion of all the grotesquerie of these dungeon deaths. Having failed to fall, it was no part of the demon plan to lure me into the abyss, and thus, there being no alternative, a different and milder destruction awaited me. Milder! I half smiled in my agony as I thought of such an application of such a term. What boots it to tell of the long, long hours of horror, more than mortal, during which I counted the rushing vibrations of the seal, inch by inch, line by line, with a descent only appreciable at intervals that seemed ages, down and still down it came. Days passed. It might have been that many days passed ere it swept so closely over me as to fan me with its acrid breath. The odor of the sharp steel forced itself into my nostrils. I prayed. I wearied heaven with my prayer for its more speedy descent. I grew frantically mad and struggled to force myself upward against the sweep of the fearful scimitar. And then I suddenly fell calm and lay smiling at the glittering death as a child at some rare bauble. There was another interval of utter insensibility. It was brief, for upon lapsing into life, there had been no perceptible descent in the pendulum. But it might have been long, for I knew there were demons who took note of my swoon and who could have arrested the vibration at pleasure. Upon my recovery too, I felt very, oh, inexpre inexpressibly sick and weak, as if through long ination. Even amid the agonies of that period, the human nature craved food. With painful effort, I outstretched my left arm as far as my bonds permitted and took possession of the small remnant which had been spared me by the rats. As I put a portion of it within my lips, there rushed to my mind a half-formed thought of joy, of hope. Yet what business had I with hope? It was, as I say, a half-formed thought. Man has many such which are never completed. I felt that it was of joy, of hope, but felt that it had perished in its formation. In vain I struggled to perfect, to regain it. Long suffering had annihilated all my ordinary powers of mind. I was an imbecile, an idiot. The vibration of the pendulum was at right angles to my left. I saw that the crescent was designed to cross the region of the heart. It would fray the surge of my robe. It would return and repeat its operations again, and again, notwithstanding terrifically wide sweep, 
some 30 feet or more, and the hissing vigor of this descent, sufficient to sunder these very walls of iron, still fraying of my robe would be all that for several minutes it would accomplish. And at this thought I paused. I dared not go farther than this reflection. I dwelt upon it with the pertinacity of attention, as if in so dwelling, I could arrest here the descents of the steel. I forced myself to ponder upon the sound of the crescent as it should pass upon the garment, upon the peculiar thrilling sensation which the friction of cloth produces on the nerves. I pondered upon all this frivolity until my teeth were on edge. Down, steadily it crept. I took a frenzied pleasure in contrasting it downward with its lateral velocity. To the right, to the left, far and wide with the shriek of a damned spirit, to my heart with the stealthy pace of a tiger. I alternately laughed and howled as the one or the other idea grew predominant. Down, certainly, relentlessly down, it vibrated within three inches of my bosom. I struggled furiously, violently to free my left arm. This was free only from the elbow to the hand. I could reach the ladder from the platter beside me to my mouth with great effort, but no farther. Could I have broken the fastenings above the elbow, I would have seized and attempted to arrest the pendulum. I might as well attempted to arrest an avalanche, down, still unceasingly, still inevitably down. I gasped and struggled at each vibration. I shrunk convulsively at its every sweep. My eyes followed its outward or upward whirls with the eagerness of the most unmeaning despair. They closed themselves spasmodically at the descent, although death would have been a relief. Oh, how unspeakable. Still I quivered in every nerve to think how slight a sinking of the machinery would precipitate that keen glistening ax upon my bosom. It was hope that prompted the nerve to quiver, the frame to shrink. It was hope, the hope that triumphs on the rack, that whispered to the death condemned even in the dungeons of the Inquisition. I saw that some 10 or 12 vibrations would bring the steel in actual contact with my robe. And with this observation, there suddenly came over my spirit all the keen collected calmness of despair. For the first time during my many hours, or perhaps days, I thought, it now occurred to me that the bandage or the surcingle which enveloped me was unique. I was tied by no separate cord. The first stroke of the razor-like crescent athwart any portion of the band would so detach it that it might be unwound from my person by any means of my left hand. But how fearful in that case, the proximity of the steel, the result of the, of the slightest struggle, how deadly. Was it likely? moreover, that the minions of the torturer had not foreseen and provided for this possibility? Was it probable that the bandage crossed my bosom in the track of the pendulum? Dreading to find my faint end, as it seemed, my last hope frustrated, I so far elevated my head as to obtain a distinct view of my breast. The surcingle enveloped my limbs and my body close in all directions, save in the path of the destroying crescent. Scarcely had I dropped my head back into its original position. There, when there flashed upon my mind what I cannot better describe as the unformed half of the idea that deliverance to which I had previously alluded, and of which a moiety only floated indeterminately through my brain when I raised food to my burning lips. The whole thought was now present, feeble, scarcely sane, scarcely definite, but still entire. I proceeded at once, with the nervous energy of despair, to attempt its execution. For many hours, the immediate vicinity of the low framework upon which I lay had been literally swarming with the rats. They were wild, bold, ravenous, their red eyes glaring upon me as if they waited for motionless on my part to make me their prey. To what food, I thought, have they been accustomed in this well? They had devoured, in spite of all my efforts to prevent them, all but a small remnant of the contents of the dish. I had fallen into a hab habitual seesaw, or wave of the hand about the platter, and at length the unconscious uniformity of the motion deprived it out of effect. In their voracity, the vermin frequently fastened their sharp fangs on my fingers. With the particles of the oily and spicy viand which now remained, I thoroughly rubbed the bandage wherever I could reach it. Then, raising my hand from the floor, I lay breathlessly steel, still. At first, the ravenous animals were startled and terrified at the change. At the cessation of the movement, they shrank alarmedly back. Many sought the well, but this was only for a moment. I had not counted in vain upon their veracity. Observing that I remained without motion, one or two of the boldest leaped upon the framework and smelt at the surcingle. 
This seemed the signal for a general rush. From the well, they hurried in fresh troops. They clung to the wood. They overran it and leaped in hundreds upon my person. The measured movement of the pendulum disturbed them not at all. Avoiding its strokes, they busied themselves with the anointed bandage. They pressed. They swarmed upon me in accumulating heaps. They writhed upon my throat. Their cold lips sought my own. I was half stifled by their thronging pressure. Disgust, for which the world has no name, swelled in my bosom and chilled with a heavy clump communist, my heart. Yet one minute, and I felt that the struggle would be over. Plainly, I perceived the loosening of the bandage. I knew that in more than one place it must be already severed. With more than human resolution, I lay still. Nor had I erred in any calculations, nor had I endured in vain. I at length felt that I was free, the surcingle held in ribbons from my body, but the stroke of the pendulum had already passed upon my bosom. It had divided the surge of the robe. It had cut through the linen beneath. Twice again it, it swung, and a sharp sense of pain shot through every nerve. But the moment of escape had arrived. At a wave of my hand, my deliverers hurried tumulously away with a steady movement, cautious, sidelong, shrinking, and slow. I slid from the embrace of the bandage and beyond the reach of the scimitar. For the moment, at least, I was free. Free! And in the grasp of the Inquisition. Thank you. That was great. Thank you, Erica. And you win the prize for most appropriate, yeah. most appropriate Zoom background <laughs> with the red eyes and everything. All right. Jeff, Lynn, take it away. Hi. I'll be reading The Conqueror Worm from Poe's short story, Lygea. I would have warm worm background too, but. Uh, they're kind of gross, so. Okay. <clears throat> Lo, tis a gallant night within the lonesome latter years. An angel thronged, be winged bedight in veils and drowned in tears. Sit in a theater to see a play of hopes and fears while the orchestra breathes fitfully the music of the spheres. Minds in the form of God on high mutter and mumble low and hither and thither fly mere puppets they who come and go at bidding of vast formless things that shift the scenery to and fro, flapping from out their condor wings, invisible woe. That motley drama, oh be sure, it shall not be forgot, with its phantom chase forevermore by a crowd that sees it not, through a circle that ever returneth into the selfsame spots, and much of madness and more of sin and horror the soul of the plot. But see, amidst the mimic rout, a crawling shape intrude, a blood red thing that rives from out the scenic solitude. It rives, it rives with mortal pangs, the mimes become its food, and seraphs sob at vermin fangs in human gore imbued. Out, out are all the lights, out all, and over each quivering form, the curtain, a funeral pall, comes down with the rush of a storm, while the angels, all pallid and wan, uprising, unveiling, and firm, that the play is the tragedy man and its hero, the conqueror worm. Very nice, very nice. And your, your background is very appropriate. Is the raven clutching some sort of weapon? It's a pen. Oh, okay, okay. That's less threatening. Yeah. All right, Han, Han Lee. Oh, you gotta unmute yourself, Han. Hi, hi okay. everyone. I want to read the mass of Red Death. Um, okay. The Red Death has long devastated the country. No bastion had ever been so fatal or so hideous. Blood was its avatar and its seam, the redness and the heart of blood. There were sharp pains and sudden dizziness, and then profuse bleeding at the pores with dissolution. The scarlet stain upon the body and especially upon the face of the victim were the past bang which shut him out from the aid and from the sympathy of his fellow men. And the whole sizer, progress, and terminations of the disease were the incidents of half an hour. But the Prince Prospero was happy and dauntless and sagacious. When his domi dominions were half depopulated, he summoned to his presence a thousand hell and light-hearted friends from among the knights and dam of his, of his court. And with these retired to a deep seclusion of one of his castellated abbeys. 
It was an extensive and magnificent, magnificent structures, the creations of the prince on eccentric yet august taste, a strong and lofty walls girdled it in. This wall had gates of iron, the courtier having entered, proud furnace and massy hammer, and welded the bolts. They resolved to leave means neither of ingress or egress to the sudden impulse of despair and a frenzy from within. The abbey was amply provisioned with such precautions and the courtier might bid defiance to contagion. The external world would take care of itself. In the meantime, it was folly to grieve or to think. The prince had provided all the appliance of leisure. There were buffoons, there were improvisatory, there were ballad dancers, there were musicians, there was beauty, there was wine. All these and security were within without the red death. It was towards the close of the fifth or sixth month of his seclusion and where the pestilence raged most fiercely abroad that the Prince Prospero entertained his thousand friends at a mass ball of the most unusual magnificence. It was a voluptuous scene that masquerade. First, but first let me tell of the rooms in which it was held. There were seven, an imperial suit and many palaces. However, such suits from a long and straight vista, while the folding doors slide back nearly to the walls on either hand, so that the view of the whole extent is fairly impeded. Here the case was very different, as might have been expected from the Duke's love of the bizarre. The apartments were so irregularly disposed that the visions embraced on but little more than one at a time. There was a sharp turn every 20 or 30 year, yards, and at each turn a novel effect. To the right and left, in the middle of each wall, a tall and narrow Gothic window looked up upon a closed corridor which pursued the winding of the suit. These windows were of stained glass whose color varied in accordance with the prevailing hue of the decorations of the chamber into which it opened. That at the eastern extremity was hung, for example, in blue, and vivid blue were its window, the second chamber was purple in its ornaments and tapestry. And here the pants were purple, the third was green throughout, and so were the casements. The fourth was furnished and lighted with orange, the fifth with white, the sixth with violet. The seventh apartment was closely shrouded with, in black velvet tapestry that hung all over the ceiling and down the walls. Falling in heavy folds upon a carpet of the same material and who, <clears throat> but in this chamber only, the color of the windows failed to correspond with the decorations. The pants here were scarlet, a deep blood color. Now, in no one of the seven apartments was there any lamp or candelabrum amid the provision of, go of golden ornaments that lay scattered to and fro or dependent from the roof. There was no light of any kind emanating from lamp or candle within the suit of chambers. But in the corridors that followed the suit, there stood opposite to each window a heavy tripod bearing a brazier of fire that projected its rays through the tinted glass and so clearly illuminated the room. <clears throat> and thus were produced a multitude of gaudy and fantastic appearances but in the western or black chamber, the effect of the fire light that streamed upon the dark hangings through the blood tin pans was ghastly in the stream and produced a wild look upon the countenance of those who enter. And there were few of the company bold enough to set foot within as per scene at all. <clears throat> it was in this apartment also that stood against the western world a gigantic flock of ebony as pendulum swung to and fro with a due, heavy, monotonous clank. And when the minute hand made the circuit of the face and the arrow was to be striking, there came from the present lungs of the clock a sound, which was clear and loud and deep and exceedingly musical, but of so peculiar a not an emphasis that in each lapse of an hour, the musicians of the orchestra were constrained to pause momentarily in the performance to hearken to the sound, and thus the wiser perforce per per sees their evolutions. And there was a brief disconcert, disconcert 
of the whole gay company. And while the gyms of the clock yet ran, it was observed that the giddiest grew pale and more ages, and so they passed their hand over their brow. I was this confused reverie or meditation. But when the echoes had fully ceased, a light laughter at once pervaded the assembly. The musicians looked at each other and smiled as if at their own nervousness and folly, and met with spring bounds, each to the other, that the next shimming of the clock should produce in them no similar emotion. And then, after the lapse of 60 minutes, which embrace 3,600 seconds of time that flies, there came yet another shimming of the clock. And then were the same disconcert and tremulousness and meditation as before. But in spite of these things, it was a gay and magnificent revel. The taste of the Duke were peculiar. He had a fine eyes for colors and effects. He disregarded the decora of mere fashion. His blends were bold and fury, and his conceptions glow with barbaric lust. There are some who would have thought him mad. His followers felt that he was not it was necessary to hear and see and touch him to be sure that he was not. He had directed in great, great part the movable embellishments of seven chambers upon occasions of this great fit. It was his own guidance taste which has given characters to the masqueraders. Be sure they were trusted. There were much clear and clear and peccancy and phantasm, much of what has been seen in Hernani. There were Arabic figures with unsuit limbs and appointments. There were delirious fancies, such as the madman fashions. There was, were much of the beautiful, much of the wanton, much of the bizarre, much of the terrible, but not a little of that which might have been, have excited disgust. To and fro in the seven chambers, there stock, in fact, a multitude of dreams, and these, the dreams with an and about taking who from the room and causing the wild music of the orchestra to seem as the echo of their step. And anon, these strike the ebony clock which stand in the hall of the velvet. And then for a moment, all is still and all is silent, said the voice of the clock. The dream are still frozen as they stand and the echoes of the chim dies away. They have endured but an instant and a light have subdued laughter and floats after them as they depart. And now again, the music swell and the dream leave and with to and fro more merrily than ever. Taken who from the, from <clears throat> the many tinted, tinted windows through which stream the rays from the tripods. But to the jamber which lies most westwardly of the seven, there are now none of the massacre who venture for the night is winding away, and there flows a ruddier light through the blood-colored pans, and the blackness of the sable trapery trap, appalls. And to him whose foot falls upon the sable carpet, there comes from near clock of ebony a muffled pill, more solemnly and pathetic path, than any which reach their ears that indulge in more remote gaiety of the other apartment. But the other apartment were densely crowded, and in them beat fervorously the hurt of life, and the rival went worryingly on, until at length there commenced the sounding of midnight upon the clock. And then the music ceased, as I have told, and the evolutions of the wiser were quieted. And there was an easy, sen an easy sen cessation of all things as before, but now there were twelve strokes to be sounded by the bell of the clock, and thus it happened, perhaps, a more of thought crept with more of time into the meditations of the thoughtful among those who rebel. And thus, too, it happened, perhaps, that before the last echoes of the Latchians had early sunk into silence, there were many individuals in the crowd who had found leisure to become aware of the presence of a mass figure which has arrested the attentions of no single individual as before. And the rumor of this new presence having spread itself whisperingly around. There arose at length from the whole company of us a murmur expressive of this 
full ovation and surprise, then gallant of terror of ours and of disgust. It is an assembly of fantasticism such as I have painted. It may well be supposed that no ordinary appearance would have excited such sensations. In truth, the masquerade license of the night was nearly unlimited. The fear in the question, in question had our heralded herald and gone beyond the bounds of even the prince's indefinite decorum. There are cores in the heart of the most reckless which cannot be touched without emotion, even the early lost, to whom life and death are equally chess. There are matters of which no chess can be made. The whole company, indeed, seem now deeply to feel that in the costume and bearing the stranger, neither wit nor prop propriety existed. The fear was tall and gaunt and shrouded from head to foot in the habiliments of the grave. The mask which concealed the visage was made so nearly to resemble the countenance of the stiffened corpse that the closest scrutiny must have had difficulty in detecting the cheat. And yet all this might have been endured, if not approved by the mad revelers around. But the murmur had gone so far as to assume the type of the Red Death. His vesture was dabbled in blood, and his broad brow, with all the features of the face, would be sprinkled with a scarlet arm. When the eyes of Spring Sparrow fell upon the stretched image, which, with a slow and solemn movement, as if more fully to sustain its role, stalked to and fro among the water, he was seen to be convulsed. convulsed. In the first moment, with a strong shudder, either of terror or distaste, but in the next, his brow reddened with rage. Who dare, he demanded harshly of the courtier who stood near him, who dare insult her with this pessimist mockery, size him and unmask him, that we may know whom we have to hang at sunrise from the battlements. It was in the eastern of Blue Jamber in which stood the Prince Prospero as he uttered these words. They ran throughout the seven room loudly and clearly, for the prince was a bold and robust man, and the music had become hushed at the waving of his hand. It was in the blue, blue room where stood the prince with a group of pale courtier by his side. At first, as he spoke, there was a slight Russian movement of this group in the directions of the intruder, who at the moment was also near at hand, and now was deliberate and stately step made closer abroad to the speaker, but from the certain nameless awe with which the mad assumptions of the murmur had inspired the whole party, party there were found none who put forth hand to size him, so that unimpeded he passed within a yard of the prince's person, and while the vast assembly, as if with one impulse, shrank from the centers of the room to the walls, he made his way uninterruptedly but with the same solemn and measured step which had distinguished him from the first, through the blue jamber to the purple, through the purple to the green, through the green to the orange, through this again to the white, and even thence to the violet, or a decided mov movement that had made to arrest him. It was then, however, that the Prince Prospero maddened with rage and the shame of his own momentary cowardice rushed hurriedly through the six chambers where none followed him on account of a deadly terror that had seized upon all. He wore aloft a draw dagger and had seized upon and approached in rabbit and petrol city to within three or four feet of the retreating figure when the latter, having attained the extremity of the velvet apartment, turned suddenly and confronted his pursuer. There was a sharp cry and the dagger dropped gleaming upon the sable carpet upon which instantly afterward fell prostrate in death of the Prince Sparsboro. Then summoning the wide courage of despair, a throng of the reveyors at once threw themselves into the black apartment and sizing the murmur whose tall figure stood erect and motionless within the shadow of the ebony clock. Gaz in unutterable horror and find the grave, the grave ceremonies and corpse-like mask, which they handled with so violent a rudeness, untenated by 
and in tangible form. And now was acknowledged the presence of the Red Death. He had come like a thief in the night, and one by one dropped the reveals in the blood it their halls of their rival, and that each of the despairing posture in his fall and the life of the Ebony. Um, and the and the life of the Ebony clock went out with that of the last of the gay, and the flames of the tribal aspire and darkness and decay and the red death hell illimitable dominion over all. Thank you, Han. That sort of hits a little too close to home these days. Um, but Han is joining us from another time zone. So thank her in particular. Okay, I'm going to take a brief pause from the readings to share the artwork that people sent in. So since we're doing a virtual event, I thought I would take this opportunity to do so. So hold on just a second. Okay, so this image, everyone can see it? Yes, so this is by Kalena Zamora, inspired by Alone, the poem that Dolly Estrada read at the top of the program. It's pretty nice. And then we have a drawing by Alison Tabas of Poe with the raven. I like the brain. I do too, yeah. Yeah, it's really good. And then, let's see, we have two more. We have a rendition of Annabelle Lee by Trinity, which I think Very is nice. Great. Yep. And then the last one by Olivia. Sorry, Olivia, I don't know your last name, but this is a chalk drawing in honor of Poe. And then I'll show you the close up of nice. the other one. There we go. Here's the Poe close up. So thank you, everyone who uh, shared artwork. Okay. Let's. Okay, the art was created by uh, her and her sister. So thank you. Excellent. Okay, we have some more poems to read. The next reader is Maria Re Revuelta. Good, that was good. <laughs> oh, and your dress is AOC. I knew you yeah, looked familiar. I'm actually wearing her lipstick too. <laughs> is it her actual brand? No, it's the brand that she buys. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. Okay, so I will be reading, reading for Annie by Edgar Allan Poe. <clears throat> Thank heaven the crisis, the danger is past, and the lingering illness is over at last, and the fever called living is conquered at last. Sadly, I know I am short of my strength, and no more so I move as I lay at full length. But no matter, I feel I am better at length, and I rest so composedly now in my bed than any beholder might fancy me dead, might start beholding me, thinking me dead. The moaning and groaning, the sighing and sobbing are quieted now with the horrible throbbing at heart. Ah, the horrible, horrible throbbing. The sickness, the nausea, the pitiless pain have ceased with fever that maddened my brain. With the fever called living that burned my brain. And oh, of all tortures, that torture, the worst, has abated the terrible torture of thirst. For the naffling river of Passion accursed, I have drank of a water that quenches authors. Of a water that flows with a lullaby sound from a spring but a very few feet underground, from a cavern not very far down underground. And ah, let it never be foolishly said that my room is, is it gloomy and narrow my bed. For man never slept in a different bed and to sleep you must slumber in, such, in just such a bed. My tantalized spirit here blandly reposes, forgetting or never regretting its roses, its old aggregations of myrtles and roses, for now, while so quietly lying, it fancies, a holier odor about it of pansies, a rosemary odor, commingled with pansies, with rue and the beautiful Puritan pansies. And so it lies happily, bathing in many a dream of the truth, and the beauty of Annie, drowned in a bath, of the tresses of Annie. She tenderly kissed me, she fondly caressed, and I felt gently, deeply to sleep from the heaven of her breast. When the light was extinguished, she covered me warm and she prayed to the angels to keep me from harm, to the queen of all angels to shield me from harm. 
And I lay so composedly now in bed, knowing her love, that you fancied me dead. And I rest so contently now in my bed with her love at my breast, that you fancied me dead, that you, that you shudder to look at me, thinking me dead. But my heart is brighter than all the mighty stars in the sky, for it sparkles with Annie, it glows with the light of the love of my Annie, with the thought of the light of the eyes of my Annie. Thank you, Maria. I think if there's anything to say about Poe, it's that he had very functional relationships with women. And that comes through in his poetry. That's a joke just for you guys who don't know. Okay, Ryan Wada, you're up next. Oh, cool. Okay. Sorry, let me just get this ready. I'll be reading uh, Spirits of the Dead. Um, <clears throat> Thy soul shall find itself alone. Mid dark thoughts of the gray tombstone, not one of all the crowd to pry into thine hour of secrecy, be silent in that solitude, which is not loneliness, for then the spirits of the dead who stood in life before thee are again in death around thee, and there will their will shall then overshadow thee, be still. For the night, though clear, shall frown, and the stars shall look not down from their high thrones in the heaven with light like hope to mortals given, but their red orbs without beam to thy weariness shall seem as a burning and a fever which would cling to thee forever. Now our thoughts thou shalt not banish, now our visions never to vanish. From thy spirit shall they pass no more like dewdrop from the grass. The breeze, the breath of God is still, and the mist upon the hill, shadowy, shadowy yet unbroken, is a symbol and a token, how it hangs upon the trees, a mystery of mysteries. Very nice. I feel like the costume really helped bring the message through. Okay. Thank you, Ryan. Kalina Zamora, who was in my class, and I would sometimes say Kalina, and I would say sometimes say Kalena. So please remind me which one is correct, and I'm very sorry. No worries, it's Kalina. Okay, and she is a ghost. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have this whole setting going on right now. Wow, that's impressive. Thank you. Okay, I'm doing the Haunted Palace. And let's talk about that. In the greenness of our valleys, by good angels tenanted, once a fair and stately palace, radiant palace, reared its head. In the monarch thought's dominion, it stood there. Never seraph spread opinion over fabric half so fair. Banners yellow, glorious golden, on its roof did float and flow. This, all this, was in the olden time long ago. And every gentle air that dallied in that sweet day along the ramparts plumbed and pallid, a winged odor went away. Wander is in that happy valley, through two luminous windows, saw spirits moving musically, to a lute's well-tuned law, round about a throne where, sitting Porophrogene, in state his glory well befitting, the ruler of the realm was seen, and all with pearl and ruby glowing was the fair palace door, through which came flowing, 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 and sparkling evermore, a troop of echoes whose sweet duty was but to sing, in voices of surpassing beauty, the wit and wisdom of their king, and evil things in robes of sorrow assailed the monarch's high estate. Ah, let us mourn, for never morrow shall dawn upon him desolate. And round about his home the glory that blushed and bloomed is but a dim remembered story of the old time entombed. And travelers now within that valley, through the red litten windows see vast forms that move fantastically to a discordant melody while like a ghastly rapid river through the pale door, a hideous throng rush out forever and laugh, but smile no more. Thank you. Thank you, our first ghost performance. Awesome ambiance. Okay, so a slight change because the next, the second, or sorry, somebody needs to leave who is going to read. So, so uh, Ulysses de la Luz, and Candace Phelan are going to go before the person that was going to go next, please.
and they're reading a dream within a dream. I think Ulysses is starting and Candace is finishing. Okay, should I go now? Okay. Take this kiss upon the brow, and in parting from you now, thus much let me avow. You are not wrong who deem that my days have been a dream. Yet, if hope has flown away in a night or in a day, in a vision or in none, is it therefore the less gone? All that we see or seem is but a dream within a dream. I stand amid the roar of a surf-tormented shore, and I hold within my hand grains of this golden sand. How few, yet how they creep through my fingers to the deep. While I weep, while I weep, O oh God, can I not grasp them in a tighter grasp, in a tighter clasp? O oh God, can I not save one from the pitiless wave? Is all that we see or seem but a dream within a dream? Very nice. Thank you guys. I think it works nicely as a as a two person read. So obviously uh, this event was supposed to go till eight. We're going over. Uh, that's fine with me, but we I definitely understand if other people need to go. We have about four more readings. So stick around if you want to. If you've gotten enough Poe, that's fine. Remember in the chat, I would love to see some Poe puns if anyone has any. Our next reader is Elizabeth Cruz, The Sunflower. Hello. Okay. I'm reading El Dorado. Gaily bedight, a gallant knight. In sunshine and in shadow, had journeyed long, singing a song in search of El Dorado. But he grew old, this knight so bold, and o'er his heart a shadow. Fell as he fawned no spot of ground that looked like El Dorado. And as his strength failed him at length, he met a pilgrim shadow. Shadow, said he, where can it be? The land of El Dorado? Over the mountains, of the moon, down the valley of the shadow, writ, ride, boldly ride. The shade replied, if you seek for El Dorado. Thank you. I feel like it's a very happy poem when you read it. I feel encouraged. Oh, <laughs> oh it's good. I think it is a happy poem. I, know, I listened to a few of them and they yeah. were kind of neutral. So I gave it my own spice. Yeah, I feel inspired to go seek for El Dorado. Thank you, Liz. All right, Paulina Gonzalez Rojas. I'll be reading Annabelle Lee. Let me just get that set up. It was many and many a year ago in a kingdom by the sea that a maiden there lived, whom you may know by the name of Annabelle Lee. And this maiden, she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. I was a child and she was a child in this kingdom by the sea. But we loved with a love that was more than love, I and my Annabelle Lee, with a love that the winged seraphs of heaven coveted her and me. And this was the reason that long ago in this kingdom by the sea, a wind blew out of a cloud, chilling my beautiful Annabelle Lee, so that her high-born kingsman came and bore her away from me to shut her up in a sepulcher in this kingdom by the sea. The angels, not half so happy in heaven, went envying her and me. Yes, that was the reason, as all men know, in this kingdom by the sea, that the wind came out of the cloud by night, chilling and killing my Annabelle Lee. But our love, it was stronger by far than the love of those who were older than we, of many far wiser than we, and neither the angels in heaven above nor the demons down under the sea can never dissever my soul from the soul of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. For the moon never beams without bringing me dreams of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. And the stars never rise, but I feel the bright eyes of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. And so all the night tide, I lie down by the side of my darling, my darling, my life and my bride in her sepulcher there by the sea, in her tomb by the sounding sea. 
Thank you. It's nice to have a sea view if you're going to be in a sepulcher. That's what I've always said. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for laughing at my jokes, Ed. Okay. I just want to verify that Destiny is not Destiny Vargas is not hiding somewhere in the Zoom names that I don't recognize. I don't think she's here. Okay. She was going to read a Valentine. All right, Maria and her cousin Carla. Carla is not an SGSU student. She is a high school student, but she is joining us and I'm very excited to welcome her. She'll be in the background. I um, might have forced her to join me. <laughs> okay, we're going to be reading uh, The Gold Bug. The chest has been full of the brim and we spent the whole day and the greater part of the next night in an obscurity of its contents. There had been nothing like order or arrangement. Everything had been heaped promiscuously. Having assorted all with care, we found ourselves possessed of even vaster wealth than we had at first supposed. In coin, there was rather more than $450,000, estimating the value of the pieces as accurately as we could by the tables of the period. There was not a particle of a silver. All was gold of an antique date and of a great variety. The value of the jewels we found more difficulty in estimating. There were diamonds, some of them exceedingly large and fine, 110 in all, and not one of them small, 18 rubies of remarkable brilliancy, 310 emeralds, all very beautiful, and 21 sapphires with an opal. Besides all of this, there was a great vast quantity of solid gold orange or ornaments, nearly 200 massive finger <clears throat> And ear rings, ring, rich chains, 30 of these, if I remember, 83 very large and heavy crucifixes, five gold censers of great value, a prodigious golden pouch bowl with two sword handles, exquisitely embossed, and many smaller articles which I cannot remember. We estimated the entire contents of the chest that night at a million and a half dollars. <clears throat> and upon subsequent disposal of the trinkets and jewels, it was found that we had greatly undervalued treasure. When we at length had concluded our examination and the intense excitement of the time had in, our, in some measure, the grand saw that I was dying with impatience for a solution of the most extraordinary riddle and entered into a full detail of, it, of the circumstances connected with it. You remember when you first handed me the scrap of parchment? I was about to crumble it up and throw it angrily into the fire. The scrap of paper, you mean? No, it had much of the appearance of paper, but I discovered at once to be a paper of very thin parchment. It was quite dirty, you remember. Well, I was at the very act of crumbling it up. My glance fell upon the figure of death's head. Here was indeed a mystery which I felt impossible to explain, but even at the early moment there seemed to glimmer faintly with the most remote and secret chambers of my intellect, a glow warm like conception of truth. The spot where we discovered the scarab, the gold bug, was on the coast of the mainland, about a mile eastern of the island and about a short distance above the high water mark. It had been buried in the sand near the remnants of the hull of a sheep's long boat. The wreck seemed to have been there for a very long while. Now, no doubt you would think me fanciful, but I already established a kind of connect. I had to put together two links of a great chain. There was a boat lying on the sea coast, and not far from the boat was a parchment with a skull depicted on it. The skull, or death's head, is the well-known emblem of the pirate. The flag of the death's head is hoisted in all engagements. But you say the skull is not upon the parchment when you... <clears throat> ah, hereupon turns the whole mystery. There was no skull apparent on the parchment. At this stage of my reflections, I endeavored to remember. The weather was chilly and a fire was blazing on the hearth. You, you had drawn a chair close to the chimney just as I placed the parchment in your hand and as you were in the act of inspecting it. Hmm, wolf, the newfound land entered and leaped upon my shoulder. <laughs> The parchment was permitted to fall listlessly between your knees in close proximity to fire. To the fire, I doubted not for a moment that the heat had been agent in bringing to light on the parchment the skull. It was clear that the action of the caloric had been imperfect or unequal. When you had gone, I immediately kindled a fire and subjected every portion of the parchment into the glowing heat. There became visible at the corner of the sleep 
or diagonally opposite to the death's head, the figure of what I at first thought to be a goat. A close scrutiny, however, satisfied me that it was indeed for, intended for a kid. Haha, <laughs> to be sure I have right to laugh at you. A million and a half is too serious a matter for me. But you are not about to establish a third link in your chain. You will not find any special connection between your pirate and a goat. But I have just said that the figure was not that of a goat. Well, a kid then, pretty much the same thing. Pretty much, but not altogether. You may have heard of the Captain Kid. The dead's head at the corner diagonally opposite had, in the same manner, the air of a stamp or seal. I presume you expected to find a letter between the stamp and the signature? Something of that kind. After all, it was a rather desire than it was rather a desire than a belief. But proceed. I am all impatient. Well, you have heard, of course, of the many stories current, the thousand vague rumors afloat from the money buried somewhere on the Atlantic by K Captain Kidd and his associates. These rumors must have had some foundation, in fact. You will observe that the stories told are all about money seekers, not about money finders. Have you ever heard of any important treasures being on Earth along the coast? Never. But that Kidd's accumulations were immense as well known. I felt a hope nearly amounting to certainty that the parchment so strangely found involved the lost record of the, of the place of deposit. I held the vellum to the fire and to my inexpressible joy found it spotted in several places with what appeared to be figures arranged in lines. These characters, as anyone might readily guess from a sapphire, but then from what is known of Kidd, I could not possibly suppose him capable of constructing any of the most absurd cyphographs. And you really solved it? Circumstances and a certain bias of mine have led me to take interest in such riddles. Yes, so I perceive. And now there is only one point which puzzles me. What are we going to make of the skeletons found in the hole? There seems only one plausible way of accounting them, and yet it is dreadful. It is clear that the kid if indeed kid, must have had assistance in the labor, but the worst of this labor concluded he may have thought it evident to remove all participants in his secret. Perhaps a couple of blows with the mackup were sufficient while his code conductors were busy in the pit. Perhaps it required a dozen. Who shall tell? Thank you, Maria and Carla. That's a a version of the gold bug that I, I believe Ed put, put into dialogue. So if you wanna read the original, the prize winning story of Poe, I gave you a link. All right, so we have one final performance and it is a big one. It's The Raven by Ed Sams. Hello everyone. <laughs> um, Poe was a Virginian. So I tend to recite The Raven with a Southern accent. Once upon a midnight dreary, as I pondered weak and weary over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, as I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a rapping, as if someone gently tapping, tapping at my chamber door. To some visitor, I muttered, tapping at my chamber door, Mere, merely this and nothing more. Ah, distinctly, I remember it was in the bleak December when each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I sought the morrow, vainly I sought to borrow from my book surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore, for that rare and radiant maiden whom the angels named Lenore, nameless here forevermore. And each silk and the sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before. So to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating to some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. This it is and nothing more. Presently, my soul grew stronger. Hesitating in no longer, sir, I said, or madam, truly, your forgiveness I implore. But the fact is, I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door. Darkness there, and nothing more. Deep within the darkness, peering, long I stood there, wondering, fearing, 
doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore, that I whispered, and then Echo murmured back the word, Lenore. Back into my chamber turning, all my soul within me burning, soon again I heard the tapping somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lattice. Let me see then what thereat is in this mystery to explore. Let my heart be still a moment and this mystery to explore. Tis the wind and nothing more. Here I open wide the shutter, when with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped the stately raven from the saintly days of yore. Not the least of decent snaty, not a minute stopped or stayed he. But with mien of lord or lady, perched above my chamber door, perched upon the bust of palace just above my chamber door, perched and sat, and nothing more. Then the ebony bird beguiling, my sad fancy and the smiling, by the stern and grave decorum of the countenance it wore, though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I cried, or sure no craven, ghastly, grim, and ancient raven, wandering from the nightly shore, Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's Plutonian shore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Much I marveled this ungainly, foul to hear discourse so plainly, though his answer little meaning, little relevancy bore. Yet we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door, bird or beast upon the sculptured bust above his chamber door, with such a name as nevermore. But the raven, sitting lonely on the placid bus, spoke only that one word, as if his soul in that one word it did outpour. Not another sound it uttered, not another feather fluttered, till I no more than scarcely muttered other friends have flown before. On the morrow you will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken by reply so aptly spoken, doubtless said I what it utters as its only stock in store, caught by some unhappy master, whom on merciful disaster followed fast and followed faster till his songs one burden bore, till the dirges of his hopes one melancholy burden bore, of never, never more. But the ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling, straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. There upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking, fancy under fancy thinking, what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim and gamely, ghastly, gaunt and ominous bird of yore, meant by croaking nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, yet no syllable expressing to the bow whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining, on the velvet violet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er. But whose velvet violet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er, she shall press, hmm, nevermore. Suddenly the air grew denser, Perfumed by some unseen censer, swung by seraphim, whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God has lent thee, are these angels he has sent thee, respite, respite, and nepenthe from my memories of Lenore. Quaff, oh, quaff this kind nepenthe, and forget the lost Lenore. Quaff the raven, nevermore. Prophet, I cried, thing of evil. Prophet still at bird or devil, whether by the tempter sent or tempest tossed the year ashore, desolate yet all undaunted, on this desert land enchanted, in this home by horror haunted, tell me, tell me, I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore, quoth the raven. Nevermore. Prophet, I cried, thing of evil. Not it still if bird or devil, by the heaven that bends above us, by the God we both adore, tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden, 
It may clasp that sainted maiden whom the angel was named Lenore, clasp that rare and radiant maiden whom the angel was named Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Be that then our sound of parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked up starting, get thee back into the tempest and this night's plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul has spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken, quit thy perch above my door, get thy beak from out my heart, and get thy form from off my floor. Quoth the raven, nevermore. And so the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting on the pallid bust of palace just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon that is dreaming, and the lamplight o'er it streaming casts its shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. Let me put my Yay! That was the Yay. most unique awesome. and amazing read ever. Well done. The Red Wizard approves and <laughs> Oh, thank you. In related news, I'm sharing the results of our costume contest. You can see the Red Wizard is our winner. <laughs> Yay. Brian, I will be sending you a very special gift certificate. Do you do you drink Starbucks? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I love me some PSLs. All right. All right. Then it will be yes. a Starbucks card. Oh my <laughs> I just need to know. Some people are too fancy for Starbucks. You never know. All right. Well, thank you all so much. Thank you to all the participants. I really appreciate your joining us, especially uh, under these circumstances. Thought that was great. Let's do a final round of uh, round of applause for the, the participants and presenters. All right. And Amy Armenta has shared a poem for those who remember Teletubbies, which should be all of us. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. Happy Halloween. And I was trying to think of a Poe pun to finish us off, but I couldn't think of one potent enough. So I'll just say uh, adieu. Uh, adieu. Uh, <laughs>